Sometimes that makes people hear it. Okay. Good morning. Uh, so I did some Slack in there. I hope you saw my Slack messages uh, about uh, things for next week. But let's let's get started here with this uh, this session. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am now recording. I think I'll move this uh, thing out of the way here and minimize that so that it doesn't take up too much screen real estate. Okay, this morning we will talk about ways to speed up Python, and we'll really focus on parallelization. But the introduction notebook, so I'm in here in NH 2022 curriculum, Rochem Parallel. This introduction talks a little bit more, and I think it's worth pausing a little bit just to consider this. We really advocate for Python for many reasons, and that to be the language that we use to program in. It's, it's got a lot of nice features that I'll just mention a few of them. The code is very readable. It's not very hard to learn relative to other languages in my own experience. And uh, there's lots of tools to use in the Python ecosystem that are very applicable to the kind of stuff that we do. But it is slow. That is just true. It's a slow language. There are many reasons. Some of the things that I just mentioned as, as things that make it uh, positive, that are positive, are the reasons that it is slow. It is relatively easy to learn because the code and very readable because it's what's called a dynamically typed language. That is, you don't have to decide what kind of thing a variable is going to be. Is this going to be a number or a string or something? You write your code and whatever the the code resolves to be, if you're the function that you called returns a string, the variable becomes a string right there and then. And sometimes you can even pass to functions different kinds of variables. And that's because of this dynamically typed uh, characteristic that it has. This in contrast to other languages, statically typed languages, where when you write the code, you have to decide what everything is and declare that to be that. And that allows those languages to be really, really fast because they can decide, for example, what implementation of addition should I use now? Addition for integers or addition for um, floating point numbers or addition for strings, right? Those are, those are gonna be fundamentally different under the hood. And Python needs at the time that you try to add two things, it needs to look at them and say, what is this thing? Is it a string? Is it a number? Do I have a function that adds a string to a number? Let me call that function if it exists and fi find it and call it and so on. And that's one of the reasons that it's really slow. And so we need to do something if we wanna speed it up, we need to do something. And there's two general approaches to speeding up code in Python. The one is, is to paralyze it. Um, it. Another thing that makes Python slow is that the, the interpreter, the Python interpreter runs on a single thread at any given time. And so if you want to run multiple threads, it has to kind of switch between these threads and that makes it slow. And that's because of something called the global interpreter lock or GIL that you might read about. And um, we need to do something extra in order to release this burden or run in, in multiple uh, processes. And that's that's really what we'll talk about today. I'll just mention the other approach so that you know that it exists and we can talk about it next week at some breakout or or um, or you can explore on your own, which is to compile your Python code in some way um, into something that does run fast, that does know about, for example, the types of things. And there, there's sort of two, that breaks down into two separate sub approaches, what, or kind of like implementations of this idea. One is Cython, which is a a quite an, uh, a relatively old and, and very, very tried, true and tested method. Cython is a really, really clever uh, library, software library that uh, takes Python code, compiles it to highly optimized C code, and then compiles that to machine code that then runs. Um, and it's really, it's quite beautiful. Um, Cython, you can think of that as a language that's a superset of Python in the sense that you can write Python and it'll take Python, it'll compile that to C and it'll run sometimes hundreds of times faster if it can. Um, but also you can add additional things. You can add the types of things. You can say this thing is always going to be um, an array of, of floating point numbers. And then Cython can take that and make things go even faster. And it's really, it's really quite uh, beautiful and is used very, very broadly. So that's one approach here. The other approach, uh, somewhat more recent, implemented in libraries like Numba and Jax that I linked to here, is to do what's called just-in-time compilation. And that's because when the code runs, it kind of resolves what, what things are here. 
And while it resolves that, there's an intermediate representation inside the machine. And here I'm very hand waving because I don't actually know the, the full details of this. There's an underlying representation in the machine that can then be compiled to be used next time that you run that code. So it just in time compiles the code and then kind of stores a, a, a machine code version of that that can be used on subsequent runs. So the first run is slow of a function is really is relatively slow because it has to do this processing. But then if you call that a thousand times, each one of those other 999 is going to be a little faster. So that's just in time compilation. So there are two, the two approaches. And then before we dive into the parallelization itself, so let me pause here just to see what questions people have so far about just kind of like these broad issues. So before we're going to turn to parallelization, which is the main topic of, of this of this tutorial, let's just uh, talk about how how we measure um, whether things are fast or slow, and that's broadly called profiling. Profiling is a broad name to like characterizing the performance of a program, and here in particular, we want to characterize the timing characteristic. So let's see uh, first. Um, so Jupiter. In Jupiter, there is a set of what are called magic functions. We'll see a few of those magic functions here today in this in this tutorial. One of these magic and magic functions are always, ooh, that's interesting. Let's try restarting that and see what happens. Um, sorry about that. Um, they're always uh, signified by a percent sign. So if you see a percent sign somewhere in a Jupiter notebook, that's not a syntactically valid Python. That percent sign, the Python interpreter would usually I'd be very confused by that percent sign in your code. Um, but in Jupyter, if you're in a Jupyter notebook, that is interpreted as a magic function. In this case, this time it function, a magic function, takes whatever code is after it and times how long it takes to run that. It times it actually by running it a few times and getting giving you back uh, a little bit of statistics. So here's an example of that, I'm running a loop and I'm taking an array and making it larger and larger, and then I'm timing the, the dot product between the matrix and its transform. Um, and you can see that it runs uh, three times, and that is because I had three different sizes there of this. And it tells you, oh, I ran this, you know, 100,000 times, and I ran this 10,000 times, and I ran the last one, which is taking longer because it's much bigger. Uh, less times. And you can see that already from here to here, we went up by like an order of magnitude in terms of time per operation. This is in, in the microseconds because this is very, very fast. I should have actually mentioned there is one more thing that you can do to speed up uh, Python code that's very important, which is to use NumPy arrays as much as possible. What NumPy does, which is really, really clever, is it takes arrays that have all the numbers are the same type. And then it goes down to a lower level to implementations in C and in Fortran that are really, really fast to do operations like these dot products. So this is really, really fast. And the reason that it is really, really fast because it is because it's done on these NumPy arrays that have really fast implementations for things like dot product implemented in other languages that are then kind of combined in there. Um, it's taking longer than I thought it should. Um, so I'll just move on here and we'll come back to the result when it does come back. Um, and so here I'm calling time it with 1% sign, and that means time that line of code. Um, down here, I'm, I have a percent percent, and that's uh, the percent percent signifies that this is a cell magic, as in it, um, it operates on the entire cell. So if I have a whole set of code here, this code is a fairly slow way of computing um, like pairwise distances between uh, um, rows and columns of a matrix. Is it taking so long? That is interesting. Um, and then- the first one. The other one is a server. Oh, maybe, maybe it is. Uh, maybe it is. Let me restart the kernel here. And, uh, hope that that resolves any issue. And I'm just gonna skip over that one and go back to this one. So this is, it's not too important what the operation is. It's kind of compared doing Euclidean distance between rows and columns of a matrix. And uh, when I run that, ooh, it has a name error because why? NPS, oh, I need to import NumPy here somewhere. So let me import NumPy as NP and then run that. And again, it runs it several times. One of the reasons the other thing might've been a little slow here is that it needs to run 
to get statistics on that, it needs to run several times. That actually ran pretty fast. But you can see this is this is pretty slow code. This is like 1.15 seconds to do like. So this this is probably not the fastest way of doing this operation. But that's beside the point. The more important point is you get, you know, in this case, it ran only seven runs because the first time it ran it, it thought that it takes a long time. So it said, I'm not going to spend all uh, 10,000 seconds here just to time this thing. I'll run it seven times and give you the time and standard deviation uh, on each one of those. So that's uh, really handy and we'll use that a lot later on in the in the tutorial when we start paralyzing things just to demonstrate that things are going faster or slower depending on how we run them. Um, I'll just point out here something that's really important and I'll do this quickly so that we can move on is that there is a whole set of tools for profiling code and one that is particularly handy is this line profiler. So this goes to like profiling in general profiling. If you're writing code and you want your and your code is, is slow and you want to know why it's slow, often you'll have in front of you like a big complicated function. And it might be obvious to you, or it might not be so obvious why the code is slow. What part of the code is the bottleneck? And really, the if you want to speed up some code, the most profitable thing to do is to start with the slowest thing fast uh, first and try to see if you can make that go faster. And Line Profiler will let you do that. So here I'm using the load extension uh, magic. So it loads an extension called the Line Profiler extension. Uh, the Line Profiler is a library, but there is also a Jupyter extension that runs here. And I'll, I'll run that in just a second. And then what you can do is you can take a function. This function could be inside your Jupyter notebook, or it could be something that you're importing from another module. And you can profile it line by line. You, you profile it by calling Again, a magic LP run. Once the extension is loaded, this magic LP run is now available. And the way that this is run is dash F. And then the input to dash F is the function that you want to profile. And then the, the kind of final input, and you can do dash F several times. You could do, I want to profile this function. I want to profile that function. I want to profile this other function. The last thing here is the code that will be called in order to do the profiling. And sometimes those two things are, are two different things, right? Sometimes you're profiling some co code deep down inside of this call and you're calling some analysis code kind of at the high level of the stack. But, ooh, this is good. Okay, um, it's gonna be that kind of morning. Um, let me just miss that and, and just try here and see what happens. Uh, Okay, sometimes that happens, so that's good to know. Um, but anyway, that what this gives us is this table then that will, gives us the performance line by line here. So you know, the first column here is how many times did I hit that code, and that's you know in the double nested loop or whatever we have a triple nested loop. Um, the innermost thing is going to be the one that hits the most, and it also accounts for the largest percent of time and of course the largest amount of time. Um, within all of this. And so I usually, the, the way I look and profile code is I get this line and then I go straight to this percent of the time and I start with this line that takes up the most percentage and I start whittling that one down. I start thinking about ways to make that one fastest until that one doesn't take as much percent. And then I'll go to the next line that has and I'll start whittling that one down until I'm, I'm pretty happy or until I look at the code and I say, there's really nothing more I can do here. So that's... Um, Line profiling is a super useful tool for speeding up slow code. Um, and we, we can talk more about this. There's, uh, Russ mentioned this notion of re refactoring, that you take some code and you change the code without changing its functionality. Um, this could be a, a, a type of refactoring. Speeding up your code is a type of refactoring where it's very important um, that you have uh, good tests that the code that the code is working before you start doing this refactoring. Sometimes you can write code that's slow, but very obvious why it works, why it's the right, right? If your code, if your code implements some math that is like a triple nested sum, then this is, it's very obvious why a triple nested loop and a triple nested sum kind of match each other. But then once you've written this code and you've tested it, now you can go and you can break up this triple nested sum into some complicated NumPy stuff that will do the triple nested sum for you. And you just want to make sure that you're testing that code as you go along and speed it up. And that's a really good way to speed code up is write the code in a very obvious but slow way, write a test for that, and then start doing this, whittling it down. 
Okay, what questions do people have about profiling, line profiling? What does this look like in a normal script that doesn't have the magic function? Um, in a normal script, what I would do is I would um, import this. I would this would be written into some module code, and I would import this function into my Jupyter notebook mm -hmm. from that function and run some code that exercises this function, and then it would it would give me the same thing here. Right, but instead of saying the file is, you know, something to do with Python, uh, sorry, something to do with IPy kernel, which is the kernel of the Jupyter notebook, it would say you, you, the file is, you know, the file into which this is written. It's in whatever wherever your library code is that has that function. Okay. But this tool in particular is you known for. This LP run is uh, no. So the line profiler uh, is actually a, a Python library and has a command line interface oh. that you can run as well. Yeah. You can run it straight on the command line. Cool. What other questions do people have? Yes. I haven't like ever really done this where I'll like have code in a slow way and then run tests and like edit it to make it faster. So I'm just curious, like how much of a benefit is it? Like how much faster could it get? Like, and I realized that would vary. In Depends the on how slow it was. Yeah. <laughs> right? So the question is how 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 much benefit do you gain from doing this? And it really depends on how, how slow you started off. Yeah. Uh, but I've seen like games of orders of magnitude. Okay. Uh, yeah, it can be, and and usually this is an exercise that I will do if it's if it hurts, right? If I'm sitting there and this is like the thing that is stopping me from getting my my work done. Okay. So if the code is already fast, I don't usually bother with this. But if it's really slow, it hurts, then I start doing this. Okay. Yes. So when I want to load this load extension line profiling without running the client. So is there like any dependency? No, there shouldn't be a dependency here. This should just work on your pod. Uh, are you running inside the Jupyter Hub? Okay. I, I honestly I don't know what is happening. And more importantly, this is not going to be important, so important for the rest of this tutorial. So let's debug you afterwards. That's okay. Okay, any questions, Zoom people? Everyone, everyone doing all right over there? I assume so, unless you uh, unmute and tell me so. All right, so I'm gonna move on from this. We're, we're not really gonna come back to this line profiling, but we are gonna use timing in what follows. And so the next few notebooks here are going to be all about, I don't care. Hmm. I should care. Oh, there we go. Um, the next few notebooks here is, are going to be about paralyzing Python, and I'm going to focus in particular on one library. There are different ways of paralyzing Python. In fact, there is inside the Python language itself, there is a library called multiprocessing, and multiprocessing does that. It, it Instead of using multiple threads, instead of giving the, the Python access to multiple threads, it starts multiple, essentially multiple Python processes and passes things between them in all kinds of magical ways. But it's really hard to write code for, for multiprocessing. And so other people have come up with other ways of writing parallel code. I am particularly fond of Dusk, and that's why I'll show it here. But I'll just say there are other ways to do this. Uh, there's there, there are other libraries that do this. But let's focus on this. And, and some of the principles are common across all of these. So if you choose to go and use something else or you need to choose, use something else, some of this will be uh, applicable there as well. Um, how does Dask work? The, so the thing that we will focus on here in this notebook is the notion of a delayed computation. And I'll, I'll show this by, by using an, a, a very simple computation as an example. So um, let's imagine that in our work, we're using these two functions um, increment that takes a number and adds one number, one to it. And then another function called add that takes two numbers and adds those two numbers together. And because um, this computation by itself is very, very fast, I've and this one as well, I've added a uh, sleep in here of one second to simulate some work, right? Let's imagine that instead of taking just uh, doing something very simple that takes no time at all. We're doing something computationally intensive that takes a second to do, plus whatever, however many microseconds this takes. 
So, okay, so let's look first at this computation here. Let's say that we have, that we have two numbers um, down here, uh, one and two. We're giving each one of those to an increment function, and then we're adding the results together to get Z. Let's just look at this code and think how long will this take to run? I see your hand up there with the right number. So say it out loud. Three seconds. Three seconds, yes. Uh, Python, each call here, and this is important, Python is blocking, right? So when it's calling this call up here, it's calling just that call and it's, it's not gonna move ahead until it's done doing this work here. So that's one second, another second over here, and another second over here give or take a few microseconds that it actually takes to do the work. So roughly uh, uh, three uh, seconds. And oh, I, I already, ooh, interesting. Uh, I need to actually run the code to define these functions. And then we can profile that with, and notice that for um, my own uh, sanity and yours, instead of using time it here, I'm using another magic called time without time it. And that uh, is much faster. And that's because it runs it only once and it reports back on how much, how much time it took to run this code just that once without giving you all the statistics. And yes, it tells us that it's three seconds. It's rounded, it's rounded down to the, uh, to the three seconds. So that takes three seconds. Um, but does it have to take that long? Uh, one thing to notice is that while this one is running, uh, there's no dependency between X1 and X2. And so if we had some way to tell Python, there's no dependency between these two things, just run them in parallel, that would be really useful. But a priori, there's no way to tell Python that these two things are independent. And so Dask has come up with a way to define the dependencies between different computations and then parallelize them as possible. And that is done using a thing called a decorator. So we're going to then, um, the, the thing that Dask does for us here is it delays the computation until you've defined all of the things that you'd like to do. And then it observes, it looks at the, what's called the computational graph of the result that you'd like to achieve. And it says, oh, looking at this, it analyzes what are the dependencies between things? What things could I do in parallel here? And I'll, I'll show you how that works. Uh, the first thing that I need to show you is that we take the functions themselves and we make a delayed version of them. And that's by importing from Dask this function called delayed. And delayed is a, a Python decorator. A decorator in Python is a function that takes a function as input and produces a function as output. And in, in, inside of delayed, something happens to increment. It takes and processes this function so that now it is a delayed function. And we'll see what that means in just a second. But this is just, it's a kind of a weird concept to wrap your head around. So I'm kind of, pausing on here is to say that delayed ink does the same thing that the ink does, but it does it in a different way. It's now does it in a delayed way. What that means, so here we have delayed add and delayed ink. We're gonna run the same computation that I ran before with one and two as inputs, then added to be Z. And um, that should take no time at all, but it's sitting there a little bit. I don't know why. I think that's not because of the code. Oh, I think this is a, I think this is actually now the the hub being. Let me restart this here and hope for the best. And um, so I defined the functions. I'm not going to run this one, but I'm going to define these delayed functions. And then I just want you to notice that when I run this cell, it takes no time at all, right? Not three seconds, but no time at all, pretty much. And that is because the result is not there yet. The result is also delayed. So we don't, have, we don't have the answer yet. What we do have is we have this neat visualization and under the hood, a conceptual representation of this idea that there are two incremental incrementation operations that then can be done that are independent of each other. And in addition, that depends on both of those that will give us up here in the top, the result Z. Right? So Dask generates this computational graph analyzes the, the dependencies. And then what it can do for us is then uh, run this instead of in three seconds in, come on, run it <laughs> in two seconds. That's the answer here in two seconds. And that's because these are, are done in parallel on separate threads in this case. 
Um, and, and we actually here, because we called compute, that's the magical, that's the thing that resolves all this is the call to this compute method of this delayed object up here. This is the delayed object, doesn't have the result yet, but when we call z.compute on it, that's when it resolves and it, it does all of the, this cascade that's the, described here and, and finally resolves to, to an answer. Yes. Is it common to do these kind of parallelizations uh, in, let's say, these apps? Because eventually we don't know the person who's pulling that Docker um, container on, on what kind of cluster they're going to be on. If, if we are implementing a bit app like this, we don't know if the actual parallelization can happen on their cluster or computer. So we'll come back to this, this kind of like, how does, what's the, what's the infrastructure here, right? How does, in this case, under the hood, like implicitly, what Dask is doing is it's it's creating a so-called local cluster, just to run just running on the the resources that are available to me here on on this uh, or not available to me as the case may be uh, on this um, Jupiter Hub. But we'll come back to this idea. This this is very powerful. Imagine if you wanted to do this with like a huge amount of data. Let's say each one of these, instead of being a single number, was a subject in a data set with a thousand subjects. And you wanted to do something where you average, I don't know, some you average their brain volumes uh, and you have a thousand subjects here, that would be a pretty demanding thing to do all at once. And in the case of, of this, uh, if this is very demanding, Dask will simply do what it can do every given point in time. If it could do two subjects at once, it'll do two subjects at once, given the resources that it has. It'll go two and then the other two and then the next two and then the next two and do that 500 times until it's done. And, but if it has all of a sudden you say, oh, look, you have here a cluster with, I don't know, thousands of CPUs and a terabyte of RAM, it will happily then go ahead and do that. And so it's not actually dangerous to put this kind of code, say, into a Docker container that runs some kind of bids app or whatever some kind of analysis pipeline, because that will do something pretty reasonable most of the time. Sometimes it won't, and you'll get all kinds of mysterious errors, but most of the time it will it'll do something pretty reasonable. But we'll come back to this uh, kind of later on when we'll unwrap, kind of like unwrap this a little bit. Yes. Yeah, like maybe in another vein of like talking about like serial versus parallel processes, is there any way to specify like, I could imagine like if you're doing like a bunch of these in parallel, you might want to do it on a GPU instead of a CPU. Right. Is there any way to like specify quickly you want it to go on the GPU? Yeah, so the question is, can you, can you do something here to say, I want, uh, given the, the, the demands of this particular task, I want this to go to this particular infrastructure. And the answer I believe is yes, that you can do that, including distribution across, between CPUs and GPUs on the same, on the same infrastructure. Um, but I haven't actually done that myself. So I, I, I know this from kind of like reading high level documentation more than actually diving into the details. Uh, Dask, I should say, like uh, many of the libraries that we we presented here over the course of the last few days, has excellent documentation and lots of examples. Uh, what they do that's, I think, special and, and really neat is they make a lot of little uh, short five minute videos of examples uh, with like a Jupyter notebook, like uh, one of the, the developers sitting there in a Jupyter notebook and kind of walking you through what they're doing in order to speed up code. And those are amazing they're really really great um so i definitely recommend going into their documentation finding these videos for the things that you're you're trying to do they have a whole website with case studies like real science case studies and uh, where people talk about really big problems and how they've been solved using uh Dask. so it's it's really quite an ecosystem yes back there Dask you apply some progress processing in the back end Sorry, could you repeat that? So you can you can actually set different. The question is, does it use multiprocessing under the hood? And the answer is, I believe yes. But also, you can set different kinds of backends. You can tell I want to use multiprocessing right now for whatever reason. Please distribute this using Python's multiprocessing. And then most of the time, actually, per default, I believe it used multithreading, which is a lot more complicated to implement but is also more, um, is gonna be faster for most cases where 
for example, all the processors are sitting on, all the threads are sitting on processors next to each other on the same machine. But this is a little bit of, of beyond my actual knowledge. So I'm kind of hand waving a little bit here. Okay, so this is this is neat, and this is very very general purpose, right? You can imagine these functions to be anything at all, really, and already you'd get some speed up from from this level of of parallelization. Again, this this uh, example that I gave of I have a data set with lots of subjects, and I want to parallel that. That's not a that's not a theoretical example. That is a way that I use. Uh, task myself. And then that box there, that ink box can be whatever at all. It can be very complicated or it can be very simple. But that's actually not the most profitable way to use Dask. And that's because Dask actually went one step further to implement data structures that resemble the, the other kinds of Python data structures that we use in data analysis. Um, so they have a data structure that implements all of these kinds of ideas under the hood for NumPy arrays that looks like a NumPy array, but is a Dask array, and we'll see that next. And I'll just mention it here, but I, I won't actually demo it. They also have a Dask data frame that looks like a regular data frame, but can, if you're doing an operation, for example, row by row on your data frame, it can take that data frame, it can divide it into chunks and then uh, send each chunk into a separate process and, and do that really fast. So, Operations that you're used to writing in, in standard uh, um, serial code can then be translated relatively straightforwardly into parallel code. And by relatively straightforwardly, I'll be really, really precise in the next notebook where I will demonstrate a particular thing that we can do with neuroscience data in, um, in using the NumPy version of this. So, so that's, that's the kind of thing that I'll demonstrate. Also. So let me go and start doing that. Um, let's see if this works now. Um, so I've put some data inside of the shared, this is data set 000114 from Open Neuro. Um, and I've downloaded the data from one subject of the functional data, all, all their nifties from one session. And that's five nifty files in there. And this is, this is the bids structure. And so you can see they did different tasks in every one of these, um, in every one of these runs, that this, it tells you the task and the file name. Um, and let's say that for purposes of characterization of this of this session and the data for this subject, I want to calculate a temporal SNR. And let's, this is not true here, but let's assume that it's all well registered to each other. I've done all the things that I need to do so that each voxel, I could take the time series of each voxel across all these scans and calculate the temporal SNR by calculating the mean over the variance in that in that particular box, so I get a TSNR map out of that. Um, not entirely accurate here, but uh, good enough. Here's what I would do, sort of in a naive implementation of that. So I import, import NumPy as NP here. I import NeBabel, which is a Python library for reading and writing uh, neuroimaging file formats. NeBabel loads. So I, I, I loop. I I start by initializing a list into which I'll put all the data. Uh, importantly, I don't know what the size of the data is up front. I don't know what the dimensions are of, of the data in here. So I, I can't uh, pre-allocate. I would otherwise maybe pre-allocate all the data, but I, I don't. So, so I put this in, uh, in a list instead. And then in each loop, I have ask, ask Nibabel to read the data in here and append the data into, the, into this list. And then when I'm done, I concatenate all these arrays. I got five arrays. I concatenate them on the last dimension, the time dimension. And I go ahead and calculate the TSNR down here using the mean method of the array and the standard deviation of the resulting array, this data array here. Uh, now let me pause and go back in here and, and just say a couple of words here. Nibabel does what's called lazy loading. So when I call nib.load nib of a particular file name, it doesn't actually read the neuroimaging data from the disk. Instead, it reads just the header and is ready to give me the data if I need it. But if I don't need the data and I just want to know, for example, what is the size of the data, it'll already have that information ready for me without taking the time and the memory to read the full uh, array of data. But here I do want to read the full array of data. So I immediately issue this get fdata, get the data in floating point format 
for me from each one. And that, that really is going to be the thing that's going to take time here. So let's time it. Come on, Jupiter, you can do it. Uh, this should take a little bit of time, but I'm not sure exactly how much. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna sit here and wait for it. I'm, I'm skeptical because of this uh, idle sign here. Let me restart this kernel, try again. Um, do you have an IDE on your local machine? That's what I've been doing. My yeah, I might, I might, uh, but yeah, the problem is I, I'm not sure I have the data on my local machine. So that's oh, right. Deep. Oh, but here we are. Uh, it's maybe it's responsive now. Let's hope for the best. Uh, so you'll see also the memory here is going to start climbing uh, quite a bit. That took, okay, it took three seconds to do. So not terrible, but could be better. Uh, we'll show you how it could be better. And that's that's that. So this is a naive approach to this, just serial processing of this. Uh, let's let's do some task magic here, right? We we notice, we look at this, and we already know this, that each read of this data could be done in parallel. We could do this reading, could be done separately for every subject. And so that's what we're going to do here. This is a little bit of cleverness here, is that I'm going to create a, a delayed version specifically of this method here, of this get F data method. The, the part that takes time is really this method, not the loading. And so what I do is I, I take the nib nifty image class, which is the, the class that gets generated when I load here. This The thing that nib.load returns is this object, nib.nifty, one image. So I take its method here, and I process it through Dask's delayed to get a delayed F, get F data. This function does the same thing that this does, but it does it in a delayed fashion. And so here I can, instead of calling it as a method, I now call it as a delayed function on each one of these loads. And, um, and I, this, the rest of the code is exactly the same, but here I call this delayed thing. And so this should take a very short amount of time because it doesn't, it shouldn't be doing anything, right? Um, I've delayed also, I should say, I've delayed here the concatenation. I've delayed the mean method uh, here. Sorry, you haven't run the... Uh, that, yeah, that should, that's... Okay, okay, okay. Uh, let me do this. Thanks a lot. I think also Jupiter is having a rough time this morning. I will... I will. Uh, I, I don't want to pause to do this right now, but I'll, I'll send an email to our our supporters who are doing the infrastructure work for this to tell them about this later today. Uh, I should import me Babel, but I'll do that here separately. Do you think it might help if the people in this room were not doing that at the same time? Don't don't worry about it. I think I think we'll get through this uh, somehow. This will be a little might be a little. So here I'm delaying everything. Okay, this should, um, I should import NumPy as well, import NumPy. And come on, this should take a very short amount of time because it's not doing actually anything except these loads. So it's doing these very short lazy loads and then everything else here is delayed. And so this TSNR computation, yeah, maybe it will would help. So maybe what I'm going to ask you all to do here in the room is to go to File, Hub Control Panel, and um, and hit the Stop My Server button. And you might need to hit that twice to stop all your servers. And then just um, follow along with me. And I apologize for this. Um, yeah. Yeah. So again, this is a uh, file hub control panel and that hub control panel should open something that looks like that. If you hit stop my server twice, I'm actually gonna do that and start my server again here and hope that things uh, things go better. I hope that I haven't made things go worse. Uh, thing. Yes. Wouldn't you need to add a time it or time um, magic function on top of that cell in which you have optimized your code with Dask? Because it hasn't got the tag. And uh, uh, well, right, right now I'm not timing it. Uh, is that is that what you're? What you're yeah. referring to? Yeah, I, I was not timing it, and 
partially because the the time that that would have taken should have been like instantaneous. So it would have should have been clear that that was less than three seconds. Well, let's let's try that again here. Uh, let me let me see if that that becomes clearer once I run this. Let me do the imports here outside of this computation, and then um, repeating things that I already did. Um, so here I'm doing the delayed thing, and you saw that was very fast. So how fast exactly is not too important, but it was uh, it's it's uh, because it's Dask, it's um, it really is just very fast, and then without too much uh, fanfare on that. The, the reason that that's fast is because it did basically nothing. It just loaded some header information for each one of these. Didn't read any data yet, but it created this graph. So this graph, right? This this really tells us what Dask Dask uh, has realized. What we realized that each one of these getf data could be done separately in parallel. Then the concatenation is kind of like where things do need to come come together. And it also not notices that you can compute mean and standard deviation in parallel. Those are also independent things. And then you have to divide between them. That requires both of them. So it's going to parallelize at two points here, actually, one in reading and then the other in computing the mean and standard deviation of the concatenated array. Yes, question. Uh, does the size of the circle have any meaning? I don't think so. No, I think it only means how long this string here is, like just the name. Yeah. Okay, so let me go ahead and, and do that and time it. And there you go. So that took off, shaved off about a half, just like sped it up 2x, which is good already. But you're looking at this and you're saying, well, this is five times, well, this should be sped up. We could speed this, possibly speed this up more if we had, if we went about it a little bit more cleverly. And that's sort of the next. So this, all, all I've shown you so far is, an implementation of the previous ideas that were with these very simple things, so something slightly more realistic with real data and kind of real constraints. Um, what I'm going to show next is that given that the data is stored inside of these files as NumPy or could be read into NumPy arrays, we can do even more here. And that's uh, using this Dask array um, object. Um, so, I'm going to again create a list to put these delayed. Now, now what I'm doing is instead of creating delayed computations, I'm going to create delayed arrays out of it. So I'm importing Dask array as DA, and then DA has a from delayed um, function that takes a delayed computation and creates a delayed array out of this. So this is a is an, an idea of an array that has no data yet. It's only when you compute it that the data gets materialized into that array and into memory. Now, delayed from delayed in Dask array needs to know some additional information. It needs to know the shape of the array that you're creating, and it needs to know the data type of that thing. And that's, that's, that's a limitation. So you can't get, just give it any arbitrary thing without knowing anything about it. But the the in the case it so happens that in the case of me babble nifty objects, when you do this, when you just load lazily load just the header information, that that re, the result of that operation knows the shape of the data and it knows the data type, or you can ask it to get the data type for you very very quickly. And so without reading again, without reading the data from file, we can create these delayed arrays uh, using the Dask array. And so here's the delayed arrays. It's a list of these list of these objects that know about their shape. So now we know what the shape is. It's 64 by 64 by 30 voxels. And then we actually notice that each one of these time series has a different length. Um, and then it knows about something about chunk sizes and it knows about its data type and so on. And I can run this computation to concatenate it um, using the Dask array concatenation. Now, not the NumPy concatenation, and then it will have uh, an, an it will have an array here, or the notion of an array with a shape that has as its final number the the sum of all of those time points. And just to make sure that that this is clear, this this visualization in Dask is uh, if this was a real NumPy array, uh, an actual NumPy array, you would expect now to see numbers in your on your screen here, but you don't. You see instead this thing, which tells you. I have this array, I know what shape it is, I know what, what amount of memory I need to represent this. I know for each chunk here, I have, I've chunked it up into chunks, just 
based on the infrastructure that I have, I think the, the best way that I can do this is have five chunks, each of 238 time points. Uh, five chunks also depends on the fact that I had these five uh, uh, files to begin with. Um, materializing this, I think, is 15 tasks. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but it also tells us about the data type that it thinks it needs to have. And then it shows us kind of the shape and the chunks um, here. So that's a useful graphic. Um, so that's the first step here is uh, kind of getting the data into a concatenated form. And then I can do the follow up with this, this computation that I want to do ultimately, which is to use the mean method of the array uh, to compute the mean on the last dimension and then the standard deviation to compute the standard deviation, divide between them. And now I have this, again, a desk array, not a, not a, a NumPy array that now has the dimension 64 by 64 by 30 because I've reduced on the last dimension, on the time dimension. I've, averaged and computer the standard deviation. So the result in the end should be this. And now it tells me to do that, you'll need 33 tasks, whatever that means. I can visualize that um, in the same way that I visualized things before. And now things are slightly more elaborate um, and more clever. Uh, it notices, right, there's the parallel read here, but it also notices that it could compute the mean and the variance on every one of these separately. And then it can combine, partially combine the mean from some and partially combine the mean from others and then aggregate those means, aggregate the variances, take a square root in the end on the variance, right? Because why compute the square root separately on each one to get the standard deviation when you can compute the variance, aggregate the variances and then compute a square root just once in the end. So it does that here in the end and then it computes the division back here. And so this is a much cleverer, just based on the fact that these are arrays, it has a much more clever, um, uh, representation under the hood. And yeah, you get, when you finally call compute, you're down at 827 from the original three. Not super impressive maybe, so it's not like orders of magnitude, but it's definitely a speed up. And the, the truth is that because the, the ultimate bottleneck here is a read from file, there's just really so much you can do here. Um, um, so this is the Dask array and, and it's just really, really clever. They do really, if you go and read how they do, there's, I think there's a whole like uh, documentation page and possibly even talks about how they do uh, things like SVDs over uh, enormous arrays stored on multiple files on multiple different computers. And so to compute the SVD, you have to have a graph like this that aggregates data from multiple places and a lot of clever math also under the hood to, to do that. Uh, but you can do that and you can do an SVD over masses of data relatively quickly. And then there's a lot of other clevernesses. There are, based on this um, this object, the Dask array object, there, there's, you can now start thinking, okay, well, I have an array, I can do array math with it, I can do, I can start doing machine learning, I can compute a PCA of huge arrays, I can compute, you know, I can start fitting all kinds of clever regression models or, or other kinds of predictive models. From and and this is this is kind of part of what we'll get to in the next notebook here is partially based on the fact that these things just don't even need to sit on the same processor on the same machine and can be aggregated through a, a large cluster of machines later uh, later on. Are they method that you can do that's carried and in the yeah, the question is, is there a one-to-one -one mapping between these methods like mean and standard deviation that exist in NumPy that are now implemented also in Dask? Could we take any NumPy code and put it in Dask? And the answer is unfortunately no, because that's that would be really great on the one hand, right? Because <laughs> you could take any code and run it here, um, but you can't take any code. And that's the reason, for example, you can't just take all of scikit-learn and apply it to Dask arrays. Instead, there's a, there's a, another implementation of a lot of scikit-learn that is like a Dask ML library that under the hood has to do a lot more work in order to, to get that. Yeah. And do you have an example of a, a method? A method that's not implemented? Uh, not necessarily the method of the, um, so the question is if I have an example here of, of one of those, I, I think the, so for example, I think np.linalg.least least squares that I showed yesterday in the machine learning, I don't think that would work directly on, on Dask arrays. Yeah, unfortunately. So even, even relatively kind of regular things that you might want to do a lot are, are not. Um, 
But okay, I selected this example specifically because you, it does work, and a lot of things will work just out of the box. Um, okay, what other what other questions? Yes, back there. Um, is it required to add the function we delayed for it to be parallel and by that? Yeah, here here I did rely heavily on this from delayed initialization function. There are other initialization functions. In Dask array, I don't actually remember off the top of my head what they are, but there are other ways to initialize Dask arrays. Uh, even even more so, there's a uh, import Dask data frame as DF, and that one has a DF dot from CSV kind of thing, right? And or from CSVs, I think even where you give it multiple CSVs, and so in the Dask data frame case, you can initialize it in many many ways, not from a delayed. But here, yes, I relied on the fact that this thing was the the Thing that created the arrays was delayed. Does, does that answer your question? I mean, I think it required to wrap it even to the function before we pass it to that. The, the thing that comes into from delayed has to be a delayed computation. Yes. Doesn't have to be a, a function that you wrap with delays. There are other ways to create arrays. For example, there's a DA dot zeros that creates a delayed zeros array with nothing or just like a preallocation, right? So that it's a detail, but maybe maybe we can we can come back to that offline later. Yes. Are the prompts in which determined Right. So the, the question is, we noticed that uh, there are chunks here. In this case, exactly five chunks. And the question is, how is that? Does that get determined? So first of all. Off the bat, it determines it based on just looking at what you're doing. In this case, it noticed that I'm reading five files, so it decided to do five. But this is also something that you can change. You can rechunk it if you wanted to and do some experiments to see, for example, if I rechunk this into 10 chunks or let's say number of processors chunks, do I get speed up doing that? So I do all this stuff. Rechunking takes no time at all. So you can you can start playing with that. But that's per default, it tries to do something kind of reasonable. And reasonable, there's many criteria for what. Okay, let me let me here go to the next one, just kind of to peel one more layer off um, and and hint at what you could do with this um, in in kind of real life settings. Uh, and I, I mentioned this already the the fact that Dask, in this case, it operates on a, what's called a local cluster that's running in in this pod here but that you could connect Dask to not local clusters. You could connect it to very large clusters that are not on your machine and start running stuff, sending these kinds of computations to, to those kinds of machines. And that's where Dask really starts to be very, very powerful. Um, so let me show you how this kind of idea of a cluster works. I'm, I'm going to do something that in the previous cases was done implicitly. I'm going to now do this more explicitly. So, there's a library, it's called Dask Distributed, and it implements these ideas of clients and clusters. This cluster here is a local cluster, but you could replace it with many other kinds of clusters. And that could be a cluster on some cloud machine, it could be on your, uh, I think it implements things like Slurm cluster and PBS cluster, and so where you have, have to submit jobs and it does that for you and so on. So I'm creating an instance of the cluster, and I'm creating an instance of a client that connects to that cluster here. And um, in the notebook, you can actually get a visualization of, of that thing. For example, now I know that this cluster per default, when I run it here, it has seven workers. And I can, for example, go in here and manually scale that. I can say, I want, instead of seven workers, give me 10 workers. And it'll, it'll go and get that pretty quickly because it's just, it's just, uh, partitioning the resources differently, uh, like memory per worker is now less, but I can do that. And then there's also visualization of the client. Uh, it pretty much tells you where the where the cluster is. It gives you some information about the scheduler and then about your workers down here. So there's a little bit of information here. It's not super useful right now, but I will point out that in, in real implementations of large DAS clusters, this dashboard, for example, will give you a lot more visualization of what each worker is doing and things of that sort. You can go and debug this um, interactively. Um, let me show you one example of how this works, just to kind of look at a different side of the things that we did before. So this is the incrementation function that we delayed before. And here I'm implementing it again, but instead of delaying it, I'm using the client object to map this incrementation 
on a bunch of numbers. Here are the numbers from zero to 99. And that creates this inks. So having mapped the function, the mapping operation takes this function, it runs it on every item in this sequence. That's a mapping operation. And the result of that is uh, a list of so-called future objects. These are also, they're similar to these delayed objects in the sense that they're not, they don't have data yet. They, they don't materialize. In this case, they've finished, but um, if I run this again, and I'm really quick here, uh, oh, they're just really fast um, in this case. But let me actually do one more step here. So I do this, and instead of, of sending that back, like trying to pull down this, let's say that I compute the total, I send the sum operation, um, to I submit the sum operation to a mapping onto these increments, then now this object is a so-called concurrent futures object. So I did I did two operations here. I, I incremented all the numbers by one and then I summed them all. So I get back one thing because that second operation is a reduction. So I had a hundred things up here and then one thing down here. That's actually a pretty common uh, parallel computing paradigm called map reduce, um, because I reduced down a series of maps. Um, and I can get the result by asking for it. I explicitly have to ask for it. And now I get it back from this concurrent futures object that I had there. Now, this is important that this has to be pulled back down from the cluster. Imagine the cluster is somewhere and it's distributed then these objects up here may be distributed across the cluster. And maybe I don't want to pull them down. Maybe also these results are all huge, right? And I don't have enough memory on my local machine, but my cluster has enough memory to represent all these things just in a distributed fashion. And that's part of the reason you do this map reduce is you do the big mapping over here, then you reduce it and that result is small and you can pull it back down to your local machine. And that's sort of the, the thing that's implemented here. Another example of this, and here I'm initializing a dask array a slightly different way, is to create random number matrices of 1,000 by 1,000 by 1,000. These are pretty big. And uh, let's see if uh, dasks fall over. And then compute the means of that. And um, so now means of these is, is actually 1,000 by 1,000 because I'm reducing one of those dimensions down. And uh, here I can say, compute that thing. And that's when it really computes. Uh, oh, now it has this thing, it's pending. <laughs> it's sitting there and trying to do this. So it's not done yet, it's still pending. Um, and that, that might take some time, right? Because I've asked it to do, to generate a lot, actually allocate a lot of memory here. That's, that's really the reason that it's uh, probably taking time. Um, still pending. When I call gather is when it's gonna kind of get everything from the, the cluster. So this is, this is, when you think about it, it's kind of a cool paradigm to do stuff. You're talking to a cluster, it's got lots of machines. The machines are maybe in different places. Uh, they're all kind of doing stuff over here with various stuff. And then at some point you say, well, gather those together and bring them back to me. And only then is when you sort of create a maybe transmission bottleneck because your machine is in one place and that those machines are in another place, a memory bottleneck because you're gathering down here. Uh, up until then, everything was distributed and you can get a cluster with lots of memory, lots of resources to do those things. Yes, question. So is there a way for the gas, it can be like SSH into a real client to do things like that? 100%, yes. Yeah, yeah. The, the question is whether this I could SSH into something else. And yeah, that's that depends a little bit on the setup up here of this cluster, and that's that's where a lot of the the kind of like system administration difficulty will come come about. Um, yeah, <clears throat> and there are a lot of variants to that, so that's hard to kind of teach one one way to do it. Yes, back there. The, the distributed uh, computation, what's the benefit of the distributed computation is the question. The, the benefit is that now you can marshal huge resources that are, they're not, you know, if you had, to, if you, if you wanted a one terabyte machine to show up here under, under this podium, that would be an expensive operation, but I can spin up a one terabyte um, cluster of machines on AWS for, you know, $3 an hour. Um, 
or you know, or get get that from our HPC through Slurm for whatever <laughs> whatever the institute pays for that. Okay, we're we're at time here. So let's there's there's this starts a lot of conversations, obviously, because there's a lot of ways this this can operate, but hopefully at least to give you a little bit of a window into how this this the things I showed in the first notebook become really, really powerful uh, on all kinds of in all kinds of settings. Um, so let's uh, stop here and then take a break until 1030 when we will gather in Alder Auditorium and the corresponding Zoom room. Thank you.